Welcome back, everybody, to the Triad of the Fours podcast, a podcast from Puerto Rican friends coming together to do deep dives into Star Wars and other nerd-related media. This is season four, and today we're very happy to welcome a special guest, Charlie Ashby from Imperial Senate Podcast, who's going to be talking some Star Wars with us and some Now and Then, the last new Beatles song. I can't believe those words just came out of my mouth in 2023. But anyway, welcome, Charlie, to the podcast. Welcome, welcome, Charlie. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> it goes, here. man. It goes. Thank you so much for uh, uh, being here with us. Uh, I'm very happy to talk to you. I mean, obviously, we've we've kept in touch. We finally met in person back in Star Wars Celebration Europe in London earlier this <laughs> year, and that was great. Yeah. As always, Celebration's a wonderful place to finally meet our internet friends and get to hug them in, <laughs> in real life, and it was great to <laughs> meet you there. So uh, it's great to kind of see your face again and like uh you know it's not as if we haven't kept in touch obviously we have uh, but you know <laughs> it's always nice to see each other how how you been doing man <laughs> exactly it's been uh, you know it's, it's been it's been interesting it's been an interesting few months obviously i think if we went back in time and spoke to ourselves at celebration what did we <laughs> expect that we wouldn't be able to podcast or talk about things that we love about for months right. and months mm-hmm. and months mm-hmm. probably not but it's nice to be in a place where we can now we can again, yes. <laughs> it's definitely been a roller coaster, uh, 2023. It has had the highest highs and, <laughs> and the lowest lows. Uh, it's uh, If anyone had asked me like how this year was going to go, I would have had wildly different <laughs> opinions depending <laughs> on, on when you asked me. And definitely Celebration was the highlight <laughs> of the year. And I was going to yeah. say, this yeah. year's going to be the best year in the history of humanity. And then the next month happened. And, yeah, yeah, and, <laughs> and here we are, and here we are. But thankfully, you here know, we we're alive, we're healthy. The strikes mm-hmm. are over. We can finally yeah. talk about, uh, you know, all the all the con all media that's out there, and especially what we are going to talk about today, which obviously we would have been able to talk about regardless of the strike status. But before we get going on all that, Charlie. You haven't been on the show uh, previously, unfortunately. We kind of wanted to make something happen uh, for Ahsoka, but that mm-hmm. obviously didn't mm-hmm. happen, um, unfortunately, because of the strikes. Yep. Uh, so, you know, not, we're making it happen now. So tell us a little bit about yourself to like our audience. Tell us, you know, about you, about uh, the Imperial Senate podcast, about what you'd like to talk about uh, there. So, yeah, give us, give us, give us the rundown on, on who Charlie is who the Imperial Senate podcasts are. Uh, I think to sum me up is to sum up the Imperial Senate podcast, really, which is that <laughs> it's purely an excuse for me, our good friend Nikki Kumar and Claire Stribling, to be very stupid, uh, very silly, and very raunchy about mm-hmm. Star Wars and pretty much anything, to be honest. Um, yeah, it started off as just an opportunity for me and Nikki to talk about Star Wars together we met through podcast circles and then that's how our friendship grew and then we met claire through there and then ever since it's just been this crazy ride where you end up at celebration meeting amazing people such as yourselves and oh stop it i mean it's, it's the best way to like yeah meet friends and it is purely an excuse to like <laughs> just be stupid which i feel like not many people appreciate that much i feel like <laughs> It gets lost a little bit in the sense of like there's ego involved. And I think 100%. Be, yeah, I agree. <laughs> people like to, you know, be happy about the fact that they get all this amazing stuff. And that's great and awesome. But also don't lose the fact that it's just a TV show movie. Mm-hmm, that we talk mm-hmm, about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. it's good just to have fun. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And to me, that point wasn't, it was highlighted the most in celebration we were like at the novotel and kind of seeing the different vibes between different people obviously we're not gonna name names here this is you know we <laughs> name names uh, uh in other in other places not not in this <laughs> in this environment but it was always but it was extremely interesting to see like who was there for the silliness and for the camaraderie and for mm-hmm. just uh you know enjoying each other's company and like who was not there for that you know i think 
we had a lot of fun. None of us were working. I mean, you did record for Imperial Senate with Nikki, but it was an unhinged uh, episode <laughs> from from what you know from from what we could appreciate after it came out. Uh, so, what did you? Yeah, what tell tell us a little bit more about like your London experience for celebration? Because I know you went to Anaheim uh, first. Well, not, I don't know at first, but like I, I know you were at Anaheim. Uh, <clears throat> how was that experience for you there? Because you have been to a couple of uh, celebrations too, including the previous celebration Europe. So, what? Uh, yeah. T t tell me a little bit about that 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 evolution, so to speak, of like being celebration Europe and then coming to having a huge block of celebrations in the U.S. and then finally returning uh, to London. What was that for you? Were you podcasting that first time? Yeah. And you went to celebration? So when I first, yeah, so I'm from London. I'm born, I'm a born Londoner. So um, for me, it, it means a lot. Even though I moved when I was nine, I, I still consider it home because it is like my family have been there. Go back a while back. So yeah, it's home for me. And obviously a lot of Star Wars comes from London. It's a very English production, that original film, especially. So there's a lot of Star Wars in London specifically as well. So I feel like it's a natural home for when everyone comes over. Mm -hmm. And for me, yeah, like the first time, the 2016 one was my first celebration ever. So, and I originally bought like one ticket for one day. And I was like, oh, I'm going to mm -hmm. try it out. And I ended up buying like the entire weekend. because I was like, I have to go. I have yeah. to go. Blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm so glad I did. Um, it was the first time I got to meet Nikki in person, mm -hmm. which was great. We had uh, we'd met each other through like um another podcast that we used to listen to together uh, but don't now uh <laughs> 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 the ego thing um uh. but yeah we met through that became friends online had a lot in common he actually lived in london at the time when we recorded oh, he was cool, yeah. so he was he was over here but we just couldn't obviously like, meet at the, at the same time because i was at uni he was doing other uni work um, so it was nice to get together, meet each other, and that sort of kickstarted the fact that we wanted to do like something together. So that actually was the reason why uh, I'm sorry, Imperial Senate Podcast was founded, really. Mm -hmm. That was where it all kind of started. And then, yeah, I've been able to go on adventures through that. Um, I have anxiety. I have an anxiety disorder. So for me, like going to my first celebration abroad was a big deal because it meant going on a plane by myself and Every time I go, it's like a like a next step sort of thing. And I, I'm sort of mm -hmm. proud of the fact that I get to the point now where, like you said, we get to hang out at bars and yeah. chill out with, you know, the creme de la creme <laughs> of Star Wars fandom. Our group um, was the best group, hands down. There's no not even an argument. I, I, I'm not, I mean, <laughs> yeah. We went over, we broke hearts, I think. We won over people. Yes. <laughs> I think we got someone fired, technically. Well, um, she got herself fired. But it was it fun. was great. Yeah. <laughs> Hashtag so, yeah, where's like, Layla? <laughs> <laughs> we're thinking if you're watching this, we're thinking of you. Hope you're well. We um, hope you're employed also. Yes. <laughs> yes. But yeah, it's ever since yeah, that, that celebration was particularly a fond one for me because it was kind of like a full circle moment where everyone who had met ever since had come mm. back to London. And it just I don't know, it just felt very, very full circle. Obviously the first time the first celebration, 2016, was just after episode seven came out, mm -hmm. and I remember watching the Force Awakens in the cinema, and like everyone, had, everyone knew at that point like what was happening and what was going on, and like seeing like the Ray saber catch and stuff, and just seeing people excited and screaming was pretty cool. Yeah, and to get to the point where actually, think about all the stuff that's happened in between, mm -hmm. all the arguments and culture yeah. wars. And, Oh, fighting and bickering and blah 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 blah. Everyone hating each other and you know sadness that and people lo losing people in real life and and then this celebration we had Daisy Ridley back announcing mm -hmm, that she's mm -hmm. returning and there was like a big applause. It's like it's just a full circle moment where you just you just remember actually a lot of this stuff is rubbish. Like people yeah. <laughs> get a lot of, yeah. lot of yeah. anger is noise. Yeah. It exactly and that noise. Yep. You got to turn the volume down a little bit. Or mute, you know, that's yeah, I think, sometimes, the, yeah. the best tool that Twitter or X, whichever you prefer to call it nowadays, <laughs> uh, has given us is the mute button. It's like, and then you can just 
drown out mm -hmm. all the all the superfluous stuff that's out there. Because um, yeah, I think celebration not just for the hijinks and the fun that ensues there. The great thing about it is kind of you put things back in perspective about what really matters. Because yeah. you know we kind of exactly, get yeah. we kind of get hung up on these social media circles of like you said the egos and the fights and the and the bad takes and all those things. But then you go to celebration, and you realize that nothing that that stuff doesn't matter it's just about yeah. and that there's yeah, I mean, still a lot of love mm -hmm. exactly it's it's, a, mm -hmm. it's it's about love yes it's the most humbling experience because it forcefully reminds you that you're actually just a child at heart mm -hmm. there's no yes. way you can, mm -hmm. no one can go to celebration with like unless you're just so out of whack with the universe and see mm -hmm. a person just as an Ewok or a Jawa and not <laughs> yeah. run into a kid yeah. and go, look, that's a Jawa. Like, if yeah. you don't do that, then what's the point? <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Nani, we got to get you into, like, one of these. I know you and I went to Orlando, and that was a shit know, show, for lack a of a better word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We did not plan correctly. Well, we didn't plan on purpose because we were like oh, too yeah. cool for school. Yeah, we thought know? we were it's too like, cool. We're yeah. like, we're just going to show up and we're just going to get into yeah. those panels. And yeah. that didn't did work. Not work. That did not work. <laughs> we, we made no friends. And nope. And we still yeah. had a blast, though. We had a blast, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I know, I know. I, I, I need to get back to it. To Tokyo, it. baby. I, Tokyo is where it's at. We're going to go. I graduate in May. So here's. Well, and you, <laughs> have, and you have the extra year, 2025. So hey, yeah. there's there's some there's some room for planning. Little room there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We gotta get a band to start. You know, uh, planning the you know uh -huh. getting the numbers ready and like the organization <laughs> of how it's gonna go. Because I think Tokyo is gonna. I mean, if 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 I I mean I might not end up going. I want to go, but I have a feeling yeah. if London was as wild as it was, like Tokyo is gonna be like a different dimension. Because if you make it to Tokyo. You yeah. gotta like double yeah. down on the party because that's gonna be a, yeah. a tough one for us, you know, on the western side of things to yeah, to make. To, so if we get yeah. to that, it's gonna it's gonna be crazy. I think anyway. It's great as well because I think it's always good to prepare, especially for celebrations, like the basics. If you've got the basics prepared, you're fine. Mm -hmm. You know, get your clothes sorted, get backup clothes for potential, you know, disasters or weather mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, get get your get your cleaning stuff, get your toothbrush, all that. That's good. It's good to prepare for the first about what, day or two, and then it just goes off the rails anyway. So, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, please, please, I I just need to go. It was such a good time. <laughs> yeah. And at this point, at this point, I feel, it's interesting because I feel like I want to go to celebration, not for the panels or anything. At this point, it's just like it's just the, just the to get, get together. together with the friends. It's yeah, a, it's, it's exactly. a big get together at that point. Like all the panels are like a bonus. Uh, yeah. Not now, which uh, obviously I think, to, to full disclosure, is kind of a it's kind of a privileged thing for like so, some of, some of us to say because we you know, we do get into panels, but that's a separate story for a separate day. Uh, <laughs> moving a little bit closer into like our topics, though, I wanted to ask you about your opinion. Obviously, finally, we can say that the strikes are over. WGA. <laughs> settled the strike a couple of weeks ago and finally this week uh, sag aftra settled the strike yeah. it still has to be ratified by voting members uh, but the strike is officially over so we don't have to do disclaimers anymore so that's great congratulations to the uh, writers and and actors on strike for getting the deal that they wanted although mm -hmm. i've been reading some stuff on some of the provisions on the ai uh, uh, mm -hmm. segments that the sag agreed to and apparently they're still not the best so we'll see what happens with that. But congratulations to all of them. And, you know, that's well fought and proved yes. that unions work. And we just need more unions, please, especially in architecture. Who'd have thought? Who'd have thought that, you know, the working class fighting for their rights would, would work, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, for, thanks to Reagan and Thatcher for kind of breaking unions <laughs> a little bit. Uh, <laughs> But Charlie, what was your what was your perspective of all of that across the pond, right? Because I think it's very it must be a little different seeing that you know uh, removed from being in that uh, in the environment, right? Because uh, I I think the actors' union in, in in the UK was supporting the SAG after strikes, but what was yeah what was the what was how was the temperature over over on your side of things or what was happening here in the US with everything? 
Was it like, oh, these yeah, I was, I was, don't know anything? Type of thing? Yeah, I was firmly pro Bob Iger. Um, you know, that guy's a legend. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all hell, the, uh, the robot overlords who mm-hmm. will replace our jobs. Um, no, uh, <laughs> yeah, you're right. It was interesting. There's certain things you obviously couldn't do. There's like conventions for like strange. I haven't been to mm. conventions for ages, but you know, sometimes you just like watch uh, interviews and stuff. It was funny watching a David Tennant interview where the majority of the questions were just foundly about his life. Like, mm-hmm. was it like going to the shops? No, oh, it's fine. Like, <laughs> it was like, so <laughs> it's like, oh, like right. you're in a. Like, he's getting paid for that, but you know, good for him. Um, yeah, like obviously, very pro union, pro people you know, getting what they want very firmly against, like you said, certain figureheads that <laughs> were against that, uh, that you may have mentioned and may still be in charge of uh, certain countries. Um, oh, and uh, <laughs> yeah, like it was just good to see people over here like support uh, mm-hmm. all the strikers. There was a moment, there was a thing in the middle of it was the summer when everyone came to support writers and everyone came to support um, the actors in Leicester Square, just really, really cool. People like Brian Cox, like speaking out. And when you've got Brian Cox, like speaking out just anyway, it's yeah. always good to have, you know, <laughs> good old Roy just shouting at people. Um, but yeah, everyone who's everyone was there, like Olivia Coleman, I believe, was there. And just, you know, it's, it's hard to fight against, I think, mm-hmm. unless you just don't know anything about it. And I can get where people get, oh, but they're all millionaires. It's like, well, no, they're not. Not everyone's mm-hmm. a millionaire. There are yeah. actors that, the vast majority are not yeah very much so so yeah very it was very strange but good strange i'm not going to complain too much about not being able to watch a marvel movie sooner than i want to anyway right because especially with the state of marvel nowadays where they kind of need to (laughs) circle back and reevaluate like how how they're pumping out all these uh, shows and movies which you know i mean i saw the marvels I thought it was fine. It was a good movie. It was a lot of fun. Uh, but <clears throat> and Loki was good. We can talk about that some other day. But I, I don't know. <laughs> like it feels like a little aimless right now. It feels like yeah. a little bit like Disjointed. phase two, where mm-hmm. they kind of don't know. And obviously, I think the whole Jonathan Major stuff is making them quake in their boots about how to proceed. Yeah. Even though it's just like, just I mean, what's the problem with recasting? You recasted Terrence Howard and didn't bat an eyelash about that it's just like it's fucking yeah. it's a multiverse yeah. who cares do what you, you can't need recast people you can't recast main characters people won't understand what's going on i, I mean, guess i'm a big james bond i'm a big james bond fan and they've never done that in that series right never never it's, it's still james sean connery Otto. as far as uh, as far as i'm aware <laughs> also uh, can i just say on topic uh, off topic but people that think that it's not the same person just because they have a different face what are you doing? <laughs> like maybe that's why they're very apprehensive. I think we do forget how stupid <laughs> the general public are. Um, so I'll give I'll give Kevin Feige that one. Quick question about <clears throat> James Bond. I know we're not talking about James okay. Bond, but I, I need to know your opinion now. Obviously, I mean this is not a spoiler at this point, but in no in no time to die, James Bond dies. So I'm mm-hmm. curious, what do you think they're gonna do now with the? Uh, is it gonna be Bond Twenty Six? Is it the next one? Yeah. What 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 do you think is gonna be the approach there? Do you think they're gonna Casino Royale him, or do you think they're just gonna? Start yeah, it'd be a reboot, complete reboot. But mm-hmm. just because that's the thing, though. It's obviously obviously Ian Fleming's stories. I think are. Oh, I don't think there's any more stories for them to adapt. Uh, the first Ian Fleming James Bond was Casino Royale, so obviously we already yeah. did that with uh, Daniel Craig. So what mm-hmm. what, what do you think is going to be the approach like, before Casino Royale, or just like plop him in the middle of his career and just like okay, whatever, this is an established Bond, and let's just get on with it type of thing. I think you need to do a story that is you can't do Casino Royale again. Yeah, because especially so soon. I mean, yeah, yeah so soon, but I mean, it has been. It'll be nearly 20 years before, since the last one came out, since the original uh, Casino Royale came out, in terms of the Daniel Craig one. <laughs> so it would have been a while back. <laughs> yeah. I think Goose years, had, had a minor years. stroke. No, it hasn't. No, it hasn't. Please continue. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, yeah, well, next year it would be, what, I think 20 years since it was announced that Daniel Craig was 
going to be bothered to leave. Stop. But let's, yeah, let's, so change, let's change. Let's change topics. I think, I think is, you broke uh, goose. This Just, is, yeah. This is, well, <laughs> if I want to really break your mind, I'll tell you, it's been 21 years since Dying of a Day. I had that DVD. I was very into that movie when <laughs> it came did. out. Yeah. I, I was very into that movie when it came out. To my shame. To my everlasting it's, shame. It's fine. It's fine. It's not as bad as people make it out to be. Uh, I don't know. I'll I'll stand here and say three out of four of the of the Brosnan era, were pretty good films. GoldenEye is yeah. still pop. Yeah, it's still so it good. GoldenEye's great. GoldenEye, Honestly, oh. yeah. Anyway, the original should... GoldenEye, the Casino, Casino Royale. Royale. Yeah, he said he rebooted Bond successfully twice, uh, which is like <laughs> incredible. We should do a James Bond episode now. We should. Now, we, we should. should. Now, yeah. With you, obviously, Charlie. Because <laughs> uh, I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting excited. You're getting good vibes. Now. Yeah. I'm getting mm-hmm. the good vibes. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but you know, okay, all these stuff, blah blah blah. But now uh, <laughs> strikes are over, and uh, kind of as a gift from the not from the strikes, but in, from the the from nature healing itself was we got gifted a brand new song from. A very old band that we never expected would be doing this in 2023. And I wasn't aware that they were going to do this. And for anyone that hasn't read the episode description, it's (laughs) from the Beatles, obviously. (laughs) Uh, And the Beatles released uh, now and then the final Beatles song. Uh, Last week, we were supposed to talk about last week, scheduling snafus, whatever. We're here now and that's what matters. Hey, what is time exactly? John Lennon's not here to talk about it, so at least we yeah. one week us one week late. It's not a big deal. Uh, Charlie, did <laughs> had have the Beatles announced that they were going to release this song a uh, way in advance, or was it kind of like a surprise drop thing? It was just like next week, new Beatles song, because that's how kind of I perceived it. It's just like a week in advance type of thing, or was it a while coming? Yeah, but, so it was kind of a mixture of both. Yeah, like it was a mixture of both in terms of like Paul McCartney, I think I think if I remember correctly, it was on like Penn and Teller's podcast. Mm-hmm. And was like, oh yeah, we've got another song coming out. Um, yeah, and yeah. <laughs> it was yeah, it was just one of those things <laughs> where he just drops like bits of info like, yeah, we're working on the, we have the stuff from Peter's. So it's like, okay, so he's got Peter Jackson technology mm-hmm. and yeah. he's somehow using that to fix up the thing. And everyone pretty much guessed it would be the now and then uh, demo mm-hmm. recording that at that point everyone knew that in the 90s for the anthology sessions yeah. george uh john uh, john george paul and ringo came together <laughs> using demo tracks given to them by yoko to you know finish off these last few songs and sadly one of them was a bit degraded Mm-hmm. Uh, more so, well, they all were a bit degraded, but one of them was more degraded than the others. The piano was just a little bit too loud over the vocals, so they had to pretty much scratch that. But they had worked on it and recorded elements for it. Mm-hmm. So everyone just assumed at some point, because they always said they would finish it one day. They're like, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, we'll finish it one day. Um, And then, yeah, I think, I think it was like 2022 may have been the first time that it was all brought up again, like, oh, Paul's thinking about doing something or along those lines. And I think it's been a bit of a drip fed mm-hmm, mm-hmm. news item ever since. And then it's pretty much, oh yeah, okay. Now it is. Sure. Like there's that big <laughs> statement. Bam. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And and what a bam it has been. It feels like Beatlemania. I mean, it, it what Beatlemania would have been in the, in the social media age to an extent. Uh, Nani, I want to hear your thoughts though. Before I tech, because I know you're in school and you're working, so you're a little out of the loop about what's going on with the world at times. So before I texted (laughs) you about doing this episode and like how and listening to the new Beatles song, were you aware? I was that there was a new (laughs) was not. I'm totally yeah. (laughs) So tell me that thought process from when I texted you to today, basically. Yeah. So I have like no social media presence so i don't even have x and instagram or anything so i'm you know i'm in law school i you know completely detached from anything (laughs) happening and then with the strike i also had kind of an excuse to even like watch less because we weren't Mm -hmm. recording so i didn't have to really pay attention to what was happening in the world and i remember like that um the short film about how everything happened kind of showed up on my feed on apple tv and i was like 
what is this the last Beatles song and I kind of just ignored it thinking it was you know kind of just something from an anthology not that it was like an actual new song Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so as soon as Goose texted me it kind of blew my mind and I went online and (laughs) And I probably texted you nonchalantly like oh yeah let's listen to the song and I was like wait a new Beatles song what so obviously I went online I watched the short film first just to see like everything how it like came together and then I looked up the music video already it already had millions of views and uh it was so surreal to because i don't know i feel like kids these days don't really care about older bands and stuff in general they but, I mean, the Beatles, it is the though, beatles, like, the, the it, beatles yeah, it is has the beatles, a huge so. like young and then following on the TikTok and then i saw the thing. video and it kind of made me cry and i was like damn you goose for making me watch this right now <laughs> I was like on a weekend that I was supposed to be preparing a presentation for class. And then Whoops. I went on this rabbit hole of like just listening to Beatles song like all weekend long. And, and it's, it's been fantastic. And it really, it, it just, it sounds so much like the Beatles, what they were able to do with the technology, mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. John's voice sounds so clear. And it just made me feel like when I was a kid again, because my parents were big fans of the Beatles and they would play the vinyls all the time. And, mm-hmm. and just listening to it again. My mom's in Europe right now, actually, so I don't know if she knows that it's out. So I would know, knowing your mom. Yeah, probably not. So she's going to freak out as soon as she comes back because, um, and my mom and I usually, I help in Thanksgiving. I don't actually, you know, cook or anything. You I stand. Just, like, sit. I stand next to her and drink. And we have always, since I went to college, like 20 years ago, good God, the first time, um, we would always, our soundtrack to Thanksgiving dinner was always the Beatles. So it's it's amazing huh. that we get to have a new song. A new song. Yep. A new, new song, basically. A new, new song, yeah. Which is something that for me was like wild, and I'll get into like how I felt about now and then. But mm-hmm. uh, because the first person that I texted about uh, this new Beatles song when I heard about it was Charlie. Uh, like Charlie okay, was the first person okay. that I immediately <laughs> texted was him to kind of like, see what he saw happening. and like what? and scared and like we're talking about it on the podcast god damn it uh so <laughs> and it was and it was funny because at the time when i was like thinking about this song i a part of my brain kind of deleted like the that there were previous new songs uh, from the, yeah, 90s. the 95 ones yeah. and, and and charlie was kind enough to remind me of that and we were talking about some of some of that stuff but in my I, from what i had remembered from when i had you know vaguely researched this years ago was free as a bird that's the only song that i like consciously remember from the beatles that they had released in the 90s and mm-hmm. full disclosure when i had listened to it way back in the day which is probably college so probably like 15 years ago holy shit and yep. i remember not digging it so much uh <laughs> but i didn't know that there were three songs i mean now now and then it's the third one I only I only knew about Free as a Bird, and then Charlie was kind enough to remind <laughs> me that no, there's other ones, and there's this other one called Real Love, and I'm like, oh wait, I had no idea about that one. <laughs> so the cool thing about listening to Now and Then has been having these conversations, kind of like going back and then revisiting yeah. the catalog. And man, when I listen to like Real Love, it's because Charlie said like, oh, that's my, I think it's Real Love, Free as a Bird, and then Now and Then, and the ranking yeah. of the new songs, I'm like, well, I gotta see for myself. And then <laughs> I listen to, I listen to Free as a Bird, and I'm like, okay, still doesn't do it for me. I can appreciate it a lot more than I did back then, because back then, probably in that whole prequel cynicism thing, where it's just like, <laughs> Era, anything yeah. new that's from everything that was original <laughs> sucks. And now, you know, now we're trying to get over that stuff. But Real Love, man, Real Love is a is a banger. Like, I, I, I've had that song on repeat all goddamn week. And that song <laughs> rocks so much. And it's kind of a <laughs> testament of how timeless the Beatles are, right? It's yeah. like music that even yeah. from 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 across the grave, right? Because this is this is the these are scary songs to to an extent. Especially now and then, because it, it's I was only saying, two I was, of them are alive right, right now. That's so. what I was saying on Twitter. On Twitter, I was saying that this yeah. is like necromancy. It's like you're like taking the voice of a dead man and like bringing yeah, it and back bring to it life, back. and mm-hmm. then like taking archival guitar parts from another dead man to then yeah. make this you know a song from two people that maybe should be dead. Uh, like in this in this day and age, it's 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 
terrifying, but in the all the all the right ways. And <laughs> and now and then more so than, than than real love, but real love is has a haunting quality. And I think it's because of how it was recorded in the nineties, because I from what everything I've been reading up on both sessions is that they tried to keep it sounding as much as close to the 60s as they could so all the old instruments all the old recording yeah. equipment everything from like that classic Beatles era and it really comes through I think in that recording in a way that now and then doesn't have and it's something you and I Charlie were talking about uh, now and then it feels a lot more modern production it, yeah it does to, mm-hmm. to, and we can talk about the merits of either of mm-hmm. them but real love has like an ethereal quality of like you know this lost Beatles song, and now and then has like this contemporary haunting, you know, uh, ghostly fashion to it that I think is really interesting to then see like both of those songs in tandem to each other because I think they're both very comparable. But before we get into that, Charlie, what was your opinion of now and then? Like, did it did it rock your world? Did it like uh, you know make you feel <laughs> things you haven't felt in a while? What was your reaction? Because I know you're a big Beatles fan as well. Yeah, look, let's be clear. It's a Beatles song. So yeah. the so, fact yeah. that it's yeah. been released mm-hmm. at all is yeah. a miracle. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, I, I, I really like it. I really enjoy it. I think out the three demos, it's definitely the weakest uh, in terms of, you know, lyrically and, mm-hmm. you know, all that sort of thing. But um, yeah, it's just for me... I I can't help but just love the fact that we get to hear those four you know, lads from Liverpool back together in one way yeah. or another. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what's special about the anthology tracks is that. And I think what's hard for me to separate, like you said, it definitely feels more of a modern production. Yeah. And there's good and bad reasons for that. Mm. And ironically, one of the good but bad reasons for that is that John's voice sounds very great because of the way that they use the AI system. So Mm -hmm. the AI tools that were used were the ones created by Peter Jackson, which goes into the audio. So they get the audio um, recording Mm -hmm. of the demo track, and then they train the audio, uh, the AI system, to pick out every individual thing. So it teaches it Mm -hmm. what John's voice sounds like, what what John's piano sounds like. It separates those and then Mm -hmm. like saves them as separate files. So John's voice is very clear. Whereas in the 90s, the way they did it was like different, like obviously not, not the same. Yeah. So the way that the tracks sound in the 90s are obviously different to how they sound now because it's just mm-hmm. a better way of doing it. But I think for songs like, like I said, I think if I had to rank the demo tracks, mm-hmm. it would go to Real Love, Free as a Bird, mm-hmm. and then Now and Then. Because Real Love is a very emotional song to me. Like I, mm-hmm. I cry every time I listen to it. It's just one of those like very emotional songs. Because it's, it's, it's just you know it's just an emblem of what the Beatles are, which is mm-hmm. love and peace, and yeah. you know it's a it's a beautiful track. That's you know John Lennon may not be with us, but he's still spouting about love and peace, and that's kind of beautiful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but like you said, that because of the recording techniques and the way that they try to fix it, it's it's very disjointed the voice because it's mm. different. It's in a different place, and it feels very. Mm like a ghost in that sense. Mm-hmm. And I think that actually yeah. lends to the recording a little bit more. Um, but it's the way you view it. And I think the way you go to that, like I'm not going to complain that John's voice sounds very good in yeah. now and then because that's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But in a sense, you know, it's part of that whole thing. Like one of the most emotional things, obviously that whole anthology, you know, the recording sessions must have been so, you know, emotional. I know oh, that yeah. they said that they had to mentally, in their minds, they had to mentally pretend mm-hmm. that John was on holiday. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And there's actual footage of them saying stuff like, uh, John, we're going to put the kettle on. Do you want a cup of tea? Or, and yeah. it's like, you just got to pretend that he's out the room. And that's very, you know, so sad, but beautiful at the same time. Like, yeah. I know. And I think, yeah, it's, all the three tracks have a kind of similar, like, theme to them all. Like it's a bit you know, like looking back and looking forward, which fit the anthology series really well, actually. Yeah, and mm-hmm. also fits this sort of last Beatles track very mm-hmm. well. Um, because lyrically, obviously, I think the idea is that the song is obviously about Yoko Ono, mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And it works mm-hmm. in that regard, but it also works in regard for the Beatles. It's like mm-hmm. John yeah. sort of calling mm-hmm. out to his friends and saying, I'm still here, and you're mm-hmm. still here, mm-hmm. right. and we're not, but we are. And it's yeah. it's like kind of beautiful and sad about that, and everlasting, because that's what it is, really. Like People want to debate the ethics of it, but for me, it's just a bit like when you save a voice recording of a loved one that's mm-hmm. passed away. It's just the same thing, like, and I, I think you'd feel a little bit more awkward if they didn't get the backing of the families. And right. Yoko gave them the tapes. Yeah. Um, I know Julian and um, Sean Lennon were promoting it. So it was um, yeah. Olivia Harrison and Danny Harrison, mm-hmm. um, who's a big Star Wars fan, by the way. Um, <laughs> we'll get to that. Yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I just think it's really cool to see them all come together and promote that because for me it's just a completion of the work that they did yeah i know that people go oh technically they didn't work together on that well no but three of them did Mm -hmm. and they were working on the blessing of someone else and john originally did that demo recording so it's nice to see it complete and i think yeah it was a it's a it's a great song it's it's a melancholic song Mm. yeah which i think is a good way to sort of end off that journey with um, but like you said, there's a bit of everything in there, in all three tracks. A little bit of different Beatles era. Mm-hmm. This one had the strings. It had, you know, the, I thought yeah. it was a really beautiful touch was the uh, the slide guitar that Paul yeah. did for George, which was pretty cool. Which is valid yeah. to like say that it was Paul because I've seen some people be saying like, oh, that's that's George's slide guitar. It's like, no, that was Paul playing homage, yeah. to, homage to George. George. So yeah. let's 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 be clear. I'm sure that if George had done his version of it, it would have been way better. Yeah, but is that George's <laughs> guitar? <laughs> I mean, no doubt, no mm. doubt. Um, yeah, it's really just cool to hear them all together, though. Yeah, and I think one of the cool things, and you mentioned it, is that Joko is the one, right, that gave them the record, the tape, for them to be able to do this because you know the common, even to this day, I mean, people are always like, Joko's the one that broke the Beatles up, and yeah. it, it it's it's kind of and i'm sure people will still ignore it to keep perpetuating that but i think it's kind of cathartic to be like you know one she didn't break them up and two she's the one that brought them back together back together yeah so it's kind of to kind of like heal that narrative i feel like a lot of these years have been about healing past narratives of toxicity towards people it's like hayden coming back to ahsoka has been healing that toxicity in the star wars fan and same with ahmed best and now with joko Mm -hmm. it's just like no joko didn't break them up she brought them back uh, to to an extent so i think that's another beautiful kind of aspect to that uh, but nanny yeah you were talking about how the music video made you feel but like do you feel the song fits well with the like now that we've talked about how the production might feel a little more modern do you yeah. still feel like it's ranked solidly as a beatles song how does how does it make you feel to me it does sound like a beatles song obviously it's a lot clearer than you know they usually were and i do love the you know kind of the graininess of the sound of vinyl and all those things but Mm -hmm. let's be real without the technology they wouldn't have been able to save this song like this song they weren't able to save it in the 90s and i think this is the only way that they could have done it and the beatles i feel were always really you know fascinated by recording technology so it makes sense i think for this last one to be a little bit crisper like it's the last one is scripts Mm -hmm. it's crisp it's up to date with like modern technology so i don't think that goes against you know beatles philosophy so Mm -hmm. i don't know it still very much feels like a beatles song to me i would not rank it amongst my favorites but it's still it's so good to have something new from them again Mm -hmm. so you know all in all, I think it's it was a gift to get this. Yeah. I mean, one thing that I do appreciate of this mix being the way it is that I, I mean, because I do like the mix of, and I'm going to talk specifically about Real Love because I love that song. Really love Real Love. Uh, <laughs> as opposed to, like, Free As A Bird is good, but I don't love it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I mean, one thing that I appreciate this type of mixing versus how they did in the night is that, Again, you can appreciate like all the individual tracks of the song much yeah. better and cleaner. Mm-hmm. And in real life, obviously, all the other Beatles are doing backing vocals and tracks to like to yeah. supplement John's. But it feels it does it doesn't like come up as much, so you don't 
really like hear those harmonies over John's as clearly. And in this one, like I remember one of the things that kind of like almost took kind of like like my breath away yeah. the first time. It's like when you start hearing like Ringo and Paul harmonizing yeah, on top of yeah. John's. And, yeah. and it's weird because, you know, you can hear John's vocals very clearly, but it still very definitely feels like an old recording of John's yeah. vocals. So they, they didn't clean it up so, so much that it feels like new yeah. John recording, right? It still feels like an old John recording is cleaned up. But then all of a sudden to hear like old Paul and old Ringo, yeah, Ringo yeah. singing over it was just like, I, it was it was like like it kind of took my breath away a little bit and that's yeah. something that I really yeah. appreciated about like this mix because like you can hear like that overlay of yeah. them over Jonas it, and again it's 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 haunting and scary it's just like yeah. oh my god yeah. you have yeah. like the ghost of John Lennon like interacting with like 80 year old versions of Paul these and 80 year old <laughs> Beatles it was John should have been an 80 year old Beatle too and, yeah like, see like he couldn't do it but you have his however old he was 30 whatever or 40 whatever with like these 80 year old you know ghosts <laughs> talking with that old ghost it, it, it it's weird like i love the song just in, yeah. on that merit and yeah, then obviously it's the, kind the of strings. bringing their whole story together yeah. you know and yeah. yeah and adding the strings was a genius idea for them to do as well which the strings too a, which yeah. the strings too is something that's really cool and charlie you probably can talk more about this uh, but they have like giles martin do it which is the son of george martin the fifth beetle right because he unfortunately yeah. passed away so he couldn't come back so again it's just like layers and layers of you know of legacy and memory mm -hmm. coming into the song that really amplifies the depth and meaning of it and to then again yeah have the son of the producer that did like all these classic beatles song then come back and try to emulate his dad to rousing success i think because those strings feel very very Beatles to me and mm -hmm. in such a way really amplifies the the depth and sentimentality of the <laughs> song in a way that I, I can't get over it. like I don't have a record player I don't have a record player and I don't have any vinyl records however I bought the vinyl for <laughs> now and then because I, did. because I was like so enamored with it and like well one the cover art for uh, the vinyl was beautiful and then not only that but it, it's i think it was really clever because side a is the single for mm -hmm. now and then and then side b is their first single which I, I think was love me do if i'm not mistaken so it's really i didn't know that that's really it's cool. so it's so poetic yeah. excuse me so poetic mm -hmm. to then have like yeah. the first single with the all last full single. circle yeah it's like ah, I, and it hasn't gotten here it gets here like a monday so like uh, I'm really looking forward, really looking forward to uh, having that because I can't play it because I'm not a record player, but at least I will have the vinyl. Uh, Charlie, tell us a little bit more about uh, the strings in that song. We were saying like how it was Giles Martin, George Martin's son doing it. Do you have a little more, uh, you know, background info on that since you have all the behind the scenes here deeds for us? Yeah, the I think it was like Abbey Road that did it, the strings, but. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't know what it was for. The string players didn't know what it was. For. So they were told, I believe they probably thought it was for his new record or something along those lines, new mm -hmm. single. It wasn't, it was for Beatles record, um, which is incredible. Imagine being in there now and thinking, oh God, I played the Beatles. Yeah, could um, you imagine being like, no. you think you're doing this random thing and suddenly, oh, I played for the last Beatles song ever. <laughs> <laughs> what? I actually, read, I actually read an article <laughs> about one of the musicians mm -hmm. that was there and she unfortunately passed away before she was able to find oh, out, no. find out that, that it was, was oh, a no. Beatles record. And like her mom was, they were interviewing her mom and her mom was like, oh my God, she would have lost, she would have loved it. She would have lost her shit because she was a huge Beatles fan. So she was so happy to do a Paul McCartney song. So if she had been able to live uh, long enough to find, find out, out that, that it was, was a Beatles, Beatles song, yeah. she would have like oh. flipped her shit. So it's again like that endearing and enduring a quality of you know of how the longevity and impact that this music has yeah. hey, i had another question um, for you oh okay. sorry yeah, finish that thought sorry no 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 i was just gonna say like um because people forget that the beatles at this stage it's easy to make like you see a lot of people that love to be cool to be like oh yeah the beatles actually weren't that good <laughs> um which whatever <laughs> like whatever um <laughs> And 
you know, there's always the cool people that don't really care for them or, you know, that was ages ago. No one really mm-hmm. cares anymore, but they're yeah. so ingrained in culture now. I don't yep. think you can escape the fact that they're so ingrained in culture and it's part of the, it is a part of a story. Like mm-hmm. if you see, like um, I was watching an interview with a very great Liverpoolian actor and they were talking about the fact that, you know, beforehand they were just seen as lower class, you know, like people, no one understood what you're saying, but because the Beatles shot to stardom, you could go anywhere around the world and people go, Oh, Liverpool, the Beatles. Mm-hmm. And it's like just one of those things where it's like a small thing can change so many people's lives. Mm-hmm. Think about, you know, the amount of weddings and people falling in love to Beatles songs, the amount of people, yeah. you know, so much has happened and still happens. And it's, you know, we were joking about James Bond a minute ago. Mm-hmm. We wouldn't have had a Bond for like Paul McCartney right. if it weren't for the fact for the Beatles. It's true. So all these small little things, you know? Um, and it is interesting, you were saying about the whole Yoko stuff. Like, oh yeah, Yoko broke up the Beatles. I find it very funny that because to me, it's a little bit like the finale to Loki. Mm-hmm. You know how Loki keeps going back and tries to change small little bits, but no matter what, it's inevitable for that to happen. For me, that's the same way the Beatles breaking up. They would have all, they've always would have broken up regardless. It mm-hmm. wasn't just Yoko. It was so many. It was like George being neglected, but also being very talented and having to go off in his own yeah. way. You know, they, that had to happen, even though it has hearts that are sold on them. We could have had so many more Beatles. Yeah, we could have done, but we had, you know, George Harrison singles. We had yeah. uh, uh, Ringo Starr's amazing photograph record uh, mm-hmm. single, yeah. which I don't know if you've ever heard, but mm-hmm. it's amazing. Good. George Harrison's oh, backing vocals are so good. That. Um, you know, all that stuff is great. And for me, I think the best sign of that is that in the 90s, you know, Free as a Bird didn't get number one. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it was, it was boycotted by the BBC. That's what I've been yes, reading. Yes, and it was beaten by, ironically, Michael Jackson, who by this stage had definitely, for, you know, become a, a villain in the Beatles mm-hmm. saga. Because yeah, he <laughs> became friendly with Paul McCartney, joked about buying his stuff, and then and then did and, and then did and then, <laughs> and then, and then sold through. <laughs> sold you know put, use the songs for adverts, which they definitely wouldn't have done beforehand. Um, and so there's a sort of a beautiful irony in the fact that now, now and then is number one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it's the first number one since 1969, I think. So it's the longest gap between a band releasing a single. That's but not crazy. only that, it's just it's a sign of the times as well. We were joking about James Bond, but uh, someone put a, a meme up the other day and said, "Imagine if you woke up from a coma." And you went, well, what year is it? And it's 2023. Okay, who's number one? It's the Beatles. Yeah. Okay, who else like... has got great songs out? The Rolling <laughs> Stones. What? <laughs> oh, okay, what's happening? Oh, yeah, Doctor Who's back on TV soon. Yeah. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. That was in 2023. <laughs> exactly, yeah. yeah. So for me, it's like, it's just a part of that. It's part of our nation now, the tapestry, mm-hmm. which, you know, especially our one is made up of plenty of bad things. But there's good things too, um, mm-hmm. and I think we're pretty proud to have the Beatles be part of it. I mean, it's not it's not a bad one to have. Uh, I'll <laughs> say I'll say that much. Uh, but to that extent of with what you were saying, I think that there's a lot of parallels, right, with the Beatles and then Star Wars, because especially with with the whole myth of how the Beatles were going to break up and how that was going to be an eventuality regardless of what you decide to blame. I think that it's very similar to Star Wars in the regard that fans want to have a scapegoat of what to blame or who to mm-hmm. point to to be able to justify why things didn't go the way that it's going for them. They right? wanted, yeah. Mm-hmm. And for the Beatles, it's, you know, for the Beatles, it's Joko Ono. And for Star Wars right now, it's a pick your villain of the week. It could be Kathy mm-hmm. Kennedy, it could be Ryan Johnson, or in the early 2000s, George Lucas. And I think that the, it, it's very interesting to see like both uh, 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 cultural icons be defined almost to the same extent by the negativity and toxicity of their fans versus the positivity of the of the body of work, right? Which <laughs> is which is yeah. kind of the mind numbing thing about it. It's like seriously, you're gonna like just focus on that negative piece of it. Uh, so. I want to talk a little bit about that. Nani, how do you feel about it? Have you ever thought about it in that way? Like how like fandom has such a, 
you know, has such ownership and, and entitlement to it that they feel that they are justified in how they judge something that they might not agree with in the same way that yeah. Beatles fans did the same thing with, uh, you know, Joko. I, I, I think with the Beatles is a far more, far more concentrated in that yeah, regard. because it was, it uh, was very there, concentrated lot, on Yoko. There's, <laughs> there's a lot less of the Beatles in that yeah. regard to kind of uh, pick yeah. and choose uh, the toxic toxic aspects of it, but, but I think there's a parallel there. <laughs> uh, I think there is, and I honestly wouldn't have thought about it until you just brought it up, so good for you for being all deep and stuff. Bam. You know? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, good for you trying to the, tie up the Beatles with uh, yeah. Star Wars. Look at that. Look at what you did. <laughs> I wouldn't have been able to do that the first year of podcasting. This is three <laughs> years in. <laughs> uh, but it is true. And I think we can see it in, in a lot of media in general, when it's something that people have really strong opinions about, or it's something that's very ingrained into the culture. There's when you have an expectation of what something is supposed to be like for you, because you don't know if other people are actually enjoying it, but yourself become very like ownershipy about it. And you become very jealous of the way that you want it to be. And then by doing that one, you kind of destroy it for everybody else that does enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And two, you don't necessarily need to love something about everything. I don't love every single Beatles song, just as I don't like every single thing that comes out about Star Wars, but I can still love both for other aspects. Mm -hmm. You know, not everything's going to resonate with everybody all the time. And the blame game is kind of pointless because one, were you involved in it? Do you know the ins and outs of everything that was happening? How how dare you really have an opinion about all the inner working of mm -hmm, mm -hmm. something that's creatively, you probably have no idea how it works. Um, and you just like blaming somebody doesn't erase that something happened negative that you don't like. So just pointing the finger at somebody does not resolve anything. Um, so, so yeah, I think it's really unfair. A lot of the things that happened to Yoko, uh, to, you know, the Beatles in general, just a lot of the history kind of, overlapping the final product the music that we love the everything that they gave us you know they're people too they get to make mistakes it's mm -hmm. you can't blame them for not giving us enough beatles music be happy that we have as many as we do i mean it's wild to think about that they released yeah. music only for a little over 10 years that's like insane that all of their body it's... of work was so concentrated and then those 10 years they changed so much from like the rockability Elvis Presley mm -hmm. stuff to yeah. you know to Abbey mm -hmm. Road. Not only that, not only that, their ages. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. Their ages. I think they were like twenty-seven when Abbey Road came out. That's that's. I don't even want to think about that because it makes me feel <laughs> as a as a failure. As a, as a I know, human. right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, okay, well. Yeah, Beatles were releasing Abbey Road in their twenties, and and I'm yeah, podcasting at thirty-five, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> it's well, fine okay well at least we're healthy i guess um yeah. uh, charlie what do you think about that uh, parallel between like the toxicity of like both groups in terms of like how they manifest their dissatisfaction with with the media that they love you're right it does tie in and like i said it's anything to do with anything that's popular um yeah. and it can start off with you know sort of not dangerous arguments like oh this isn't my favorite because of this blah 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 and it can descend to the extent of yeah. conspiracy mm -hmm. yeah i mean look at the pool is the pool is dead theory. i love that though I, it's so good it's so funny it's insane it's insane <laughs> it's great and it's people still it, it's believe stupid. it it's stupid but i love it so yeah. much uh. <laughs> like people just like you said people won't accept that the people we love and the people we look up to are fallible mm -hmm. and got a bit human um because how, how dare you ever consider that so of course you have to come up with a theory that he's not paul mccartney doesn't make mistakes he he died in the 60s <laughs> it was replaced yeah, by yeah. some other guy billy yeah. shears, billy. Billy shears. <laughs> <laughs> so, which is so ridiculous um and yeah like you're saying it's a mixture of things like with yoko of course it's very easy to blame the yeah. Let's be honest, foreign woman. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Than anything else. And the Beatles, you know, have been very open about the fact that their music 
comes a lot from black music. Mm. Like most of rock and roll, let's be honest, they've just been yeah. inspired by black mm-hmm. musicians who very much were responsible for the blues. And um, mm-hmm. we wouldn't have the Beatles without black musicians. Mm. And they were very open about that. Same with David Bowie, which I also appreciated that mm. he was very open, mm-hmm. fought for those musicians. Because some of our artists don't accept that and don't come out, out up about it. And, you know, it's the same with it. It's very funny for me to have people argue about an Asian woman ruining the Beatles when mm-hmm. at the same time you're listening to music that's firmly inspired by Indian music. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And be like, wow, these white guys know what they're doing. <laughs> like, I love George Harrison. And, they, and then absolutely, he was inspired by those musicians and yeah. you know, amplified those voices and those musicians himself. So he's not the issue. It's, it's when people like, are so ridiculous in their like nature and for me like it's also you're also dismissing yoko's humanity in that regard because mm. you're saying oh yeah. no it's because of this it's like in with all due respect to yoko i think she was a bit annoying <laughs> like, <laughs> i mean that's absolutely that's, fine that's i mean if you, watch the, <laughs> if you watch the footage sessions it's like okay you can stop screaming now you know you but she's one that she's <laughs> it's i love that, very, that that clip from when John Lennon is playing with Chuck Berry and they just <laughs> and the audio guy just like turns off her microphone because he's just like a banshee in the background. He's like, oh. <laughs> and it's, yeah, it's, it's the way you view things now. Like I remember when the Get Back documentary came out and there's a really lovely session where uh, Linda McCartney's daughter starts playing with them and starts sort of like mimicking Yoko screaming. And all these people are like, ha, ah, look, see, even she knows that it's stupid and she's making fun of her. And she's not. She's just doing what she was doing. And John yeah. Lennon could be like, look, Yoko, look. And she's like smiling. It's because it's just fun. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. I think whatever you thought, like Yoko and John were clearly an interesting couple because they were both so artistic and a bit out there and a bit. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. I don't know if I'd like to like be like best friends with those two. <laughs> like, I think they'd be a bit... We've all got we've all got friends that are like intense, a weird, yeah. intense weird <laughs> couple. Yeah, yeah. Where you like, I love you, but I don't want to stay on holiday with you because I feel yeah. like you're there's only so much I can take at a time. <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm. So that's what I feel about that, and I think, like you said, the same with Star Wars. You know, it's very like Star Wars is very much inspired by different cultures. Yeah. And to be just 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 to ignore that aspect is folly. Most myths are inspired by cultures, like history is inspired by yeah. cultures and the way we take things on. So it's just, yeah, it's ridiculous. And again, like you said, the, the Kathleen Kennedy is a woman in charge. That's why she's an easy target because, yeah, you know, we're not, we're not going to see people fight back for her the same way you do against George Lucas. Like, see George Lucas now up to the 180 because the threat of a e- bigger evil, a woman with power. Oh, God. Right. Could you imagine? Oh, yeah. It's so um, terrifying. <laughs> it's very terrifying. Yeah. So, yeah. And like you said, it's the same with Yoko. Like, she's the one who's responsible for giving us back yeah. that voice and providing, you know, and it is, it, again, it's, it's the complications. And I feel like you have to look at both sides before you can make a, a rational argument. If you're going to argue stuff like, well, yeah, but she did break up that marriage. Of course she did. And that's not great. But look at the other Beatles. No, but like I like George Harrison's my favorite. Mm. He did a lot of Gene. <laughs> um, he, he got around. That's what that's just he got around that way. <laughs> he slept with one of the Beatles' wives. I, that's yeah. That's what yeah. I was alluding to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, okay. but he's George Harrison, you, you know. Yeah, and, and really same was. with and same with John Lennon. Like people kind of forget that he wasn't the best husband, to put it extremely mildly, to his first yeah. wife. And yeah, and, it makes and, it makes singing get get getting better very awkward at karaoke. I love that song, but yeah, <laughs> uh, but when you but, but but then when you find out that it's actually kind of autobiographical to an extent, it's like oh, like you're kind of yeah, you would have gotten you get the part of the song and you're like I used to be cruel to my woman. Oh, oh, yeah. it's like oh, <laughs> maybe maybe apologize Uh-oh. to her like instead of like putting it for a song for everybody to here i mean and, and same with julian you know like uh, like not not the best father to put it mildly on that one and and not k- k- keeping him in the will and stuff was 
weird, especially because he was already starting to heal his relationship with him, like towards the end before yeah. like he got uh, assassinated. So like to kind of, and maybe it was an oversight. Like he didn't think about updating the the will before he, you know, who 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 can see that they're gonna get shot, you know? And uh, so uh, so I don't know if that was a thing. It's like, well, I didn't just get to it because I'm busy with life. And that's why the, the Will thing didn't get updated. But I don't know if you've ever watched this, but there's a really beautiful interview with Julian Lennon talking about that situation with Yoko. And it's the most beautiful thing I've ever watched in my life because it's he's such... And obviously his mum was such a kind soul mm -hmm. and the fact that she dealt with that big impact. And, you know, it must have been very embarrassing to come home and see your husband with another woman. Yeah. Um, you know, especially like they got together very young and stuff, and you know, I'm not judging anyone for everything, but she, he's he's he she definitely raised him right because there's a really beautiful moment where he talks and he says about how he had to forgive Yoko because the stuff she did with him as well, like not like they sold off all of his stuff and like mm. some of the stuff that was promised to him, and that you know, I think he's he's been open in the fact that Julian has had to buy loads of his stuff at auctions, his dad's stuff at auctions spending his own money like to get stuff <laughs> like should any person should have for their father mm -hmm. um even letters to him um and there's, there's a moment where he says i just got to the point where i stopped like i can't hate this woman anymore like i can't be angry at this woman because he's my brother's mum. Mm -hmm. and i just see my yeah. my brother's face and i'm not gonna cause more pain to my brother so i'm done with it and i thought how like selfless do you have to be yeah. to, like it's so beautiful and emotional and i think that's kind of what the point is is that with star wars and the beatles or anything like that it, things are complicated and the emotions are mixed and things can't get solved in easy manners and i think that sometimes people get confused by that notion and mm -hmm. look for an easy answer where there might not be one I mean, it's one of those things too, where it's like hindsight's twenty twenty. It's easy to judge yeah. something from the past with clarity when like, you're seeing it from an outside perspective, and you know, and you see all the context from it. It's easy to say like, well, this is the easy solution. But when you're in the moment and you don't have the yeah. benefit of, of foresight, and you're you know in it and emotions, and it's it's tough. It's tough. Like look, I mean, we have to just look at ourselves, right? We we don't make the right decisions all the time. So it's like one of those things. Why are we judging someone else? We're doing the wrong decision at a time too. Not to say that we forgive every wrong decision because, you know, some of the things that John did were very clearly wrong, regardless <laughs> of when it was done. And obviously yeah. I'm talking about his first marriage. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, but I think, I think if anything, the Beatles has taught us is to kind of love and be forgiving and to, kind of listen mm -hmm. to them and then not have those qualities in our lives is kind of a disservice to them especially with these kind of last songs that they've given us that talk about those things in a very and unambiguous way it's just like just just love just love man just love because you don't know when exactly. you're gonna be when you're gonna be a ghost haunting someone's recording and you know <laughs> in a couple of decades time especially um like real love, those lyrics, are, I think, sum up the Beatles the most. They're the most beautiful lyrics. I feel like for me. God, I love that song. Um, damn, damn you so... for, for reminding me of it. <laughs> <laughs> the one way is like, uh, thought I'd been loving before, but in my heart, I wanted more. Seems like all I really wanted to do was wait for you. It's like, ah. Oh. And, and him like, and the guitar and like the George Harrison guitar. Come on. Ah. The guitar, the, the vocals, and Free as a Bird. Have you seen the music videos? It's great. Songs? It's great. Those are very emotional. Very yeah. emotional. And I feel like there's so much in there. And I think that's what's great as well. Is like all those songs have something that I feel very Beatles esque and are a nod of the hat in respect. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's is it Free as a Bird that has the reverse footage at the end? I don't remember. I, I just saw them like all the, this week but i can't remember i just know that the free as a bird one has one that starts with like all the faces kind of merging into each other which is like just yeah. beautiful but the free as a bird the track has it ends on a reverse on a reverse vocal cording which is what john loved 
mm-hmm. and it's mm-hmm. of John saying playing the banjo, I think, and saying how was that or something along those lines. Now I need to listen, to which it. is God, great. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I guess my Sunday's gonna continue to be a Beatles, yeah, Beatles uh, black day, hole. Mm-hmm. which is not a bad thing. Which is not a bad it's thing. It's not. It is honest. not. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is one of those things where we could be talking kind of ad nauseum uh, forever because there's so much Beatles stuff and so much lore. I guess we could we could say uh, from from the Fab Four that it would we you know we it would be like forever. And <laughs> unfortunately, we don't have that time. So uh, before we start wrapping up, uh, we gotta keep the thing going with Star Wars a little bit since you know we have been known to talk about Star Wars on this podcast. Uh, Charlie, closing thoughts a little bit on Ahsoka. We know we weren't able to talk about it while it was happening. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you thought about the show and what you're kind of looking forward to now in the future of a post-WGA SAG after strike Star Wars? Bit of an exclusive for you here, because this is my like my first time saying my thoughts on a podcast about Ahsoka. Um, oh shit, we're gonna have to make this a, its own clip so you can put it on ISP. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, ex- yeah oh, big exclusive. Um, I really liked Ahsoka. Um, it was sort of the Star Wars that I like the most, where it's clearly, you know, it's a little bit different, a little bit out there, but very much the yeah. core. What, it mm-hmm. felt very A New Hope to me in certain regards. Um, very Clone Wars-y, mm-hmm. naturally. Yes, naturally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> again, there the are bits that I think can be improved in future seasons. And I think obviously, like with COVID and all that stuff, probably hindered that a little bit. Um, and again, it's really stupid stuff. I, I feel like sometimes when I talk about these issues, it's like, who cares? But it's just for me. <laughs> like, I think the lightsabers in some of the Disney Plus shows have been a bit weird, like the hmm. way they're done. Um, because the way that the technology is used now is that they have the actual like light coming out of them. Mm-hmm. I feel like there's not much post effects work done to that. So it just feels a little more off than even the sequel trilogy movies, which you can tell have had the extra like effects put onto it. Um, mm-hmm. So that's one. That's the, like that's like the, the sort of gripes I have. Like oh, that's a that's pedantic. a big one. That's a big gripe. It's a pretendic gripe, but those sort of things like a, sometimes the lightsabers look great. Sometimes they look a little bit like off to me. Um, but the story, I was happy with the story. I was excited to see where we go with the story. I think it does a really good job at teasing out elements that we can explore in other shows or perhaps a sequel, like a season two. Um, and I like that it surprised me a little bit. Like, I think we all just sort of expected Ahsoka to come back at the end of the series. And mm-hmm. it'd be like, well, get the gang go together. We've got a fight for all now. Wacka wacka. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it didn't. It challenged you. It was like, no, actually, she's she's. This isn't her journey. Like, her journey was brought to that place, but something else needs both Sabine and Ahsoka. Mm-hmm. And fundamentally, the whole point of the season was a story about masters and apprentices, and yeah. growing and learning, and healing. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for Ahsoka, she got to heal. I would say personally. It's interesting how people view the Force Ghosts, in my opinion, because it almost feels like people reduce them to this weird ethereal being without any sort of soul still, which I don't think is the case. Yeah. I think Obi-Wan clearly has concern for Luke in Empire. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. um, I think Yoda has concern for Luke as a Force Ghost. And just because they're more like ethereal and have like connections to the Force and can see things differently. I think they still have an emotional bond. So for mm-hmm. me, it was very great to see Anakin deal with yeah. Ahsoka and getting to see Hayden deliver a performance that this isn't Anakin 2.0 way. Like, I'm just Anakin again. This isn't Anakin yeah. that's been Vader. Yeah. And you can exactly. see the yeah. toll yeah. it has on him. And mm-hmm. you can see that. And I thought it was a really great performance by Hayden because you can tell like the toll yeah. it had on him. And just the small bits like when he says, oh, I've heard that before. And it's like a clearly nod towards Luke being like, it's mm-hmm. still good in you. Like, that's the stuff I love. Like, that's the stuff I appreciate. So I liked it. It was a healing experience for Sabine. It was a healing experience for Ahsoka. Yeah. And for them to move forward. Now we get, to, I think what people wanted to see in this first season was like, 
Ahsoka and Sabine, badass together. And I feel like that's not really a story you can just start off with. So I feel like season mm-hmm. two would go from there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think there's a lot of intriguing stuff you can go forward with this. And I really liked I thought, Ezra. Fantastic casting. Ezra oh, was Ezra my favorite was fantastic. Jedi. Yep. Like, Ezra's like, if you said to me, what is the ideal Jedi? I'd say Ezra Bridger because he's, to me, oh, wow. he's what he, I feel like a Jedi should be. You know, like he doesn't necessarily need a lightsaber. He's very open yeah. with life and creatures and treats people with respect. The fact that he had, you know, he was trapped on this world for God knows how long, like 10 years, right? Mm, no way back for his fa- He's lost his family and now he's lost his other family. He doesn't know if his home planet that he cared so much about was saved or not. And yet yeah. he still found the time to integrate himself with a different culture and look after them. Yeah. And- you know, become yep. friends with them. That's that, that's such a Jedi concept that really, really bothers me when you see like, what should a Jedi be? And it's always a badass warrior, mm-hmm. cool guy with a lightsaber. And I'm like, that's not really what it's about. <laughs> like, it's about yeah. being like Ezra in terms of, you know, he didn't go straight into warrior mode. Still, like, he became a sort of a peaceful guy afterwards. Like, he didn't, he didn't have to. It didn't take long for him to go back into that sort of style. So I really like that. And he's very defensive of his lightsaber technique, I feel like. Yeah. So, yeah, he's what I think people think Cal is sometimes in the games. Like, I haven't played the second game, so no spoilers for that. That's great. But That's great. So, I'm going to say about it. I don't think, I don't think Ezra would like yeet a goat off a cliff. <laughs> <laughs> is what I'm saying. No, he, do, he also so, doesn't have to obey video game mechanics. So, he has that, at, true, he has that going also for him. True. <laughs> then again, he just double jump. He, true, true. But interesting. Nani, um, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. No, sorry. Yeah, I was pretty much done. Yeah. So, Nani, what are, I mean, now in like these closing thoughts of like Beatles and Star Wars, obviously, you mm-hmm. and I have talked about, about Ahsoka uh, yeah. ad nauseum, basically. So, like, what are now <laughs> you like looking forward to? Since there's no more Beatles songs, I guess we can't look forward to that unless <laughs> Joko finds another cassette. Uh, <laughs> well, what are, well, you never know. Maybe there is. Oh, I don't know if you've ever heard. Have you heard Jod and Paul's last performance together? Mm, I don't think. Well, if you haven't sent it to me, then I probably haven't. There is a. I think it's like. An, I can't remember. It's like an hour long. There is the last time John and Paul hung out together was like in the eighties, I think, or like the, or early eighties or late seventies. And this, everyone in this video is so high off their heads on coke, it's ridiculous. <laughs> the music is absolutely terrible. <laughs> um. Because they're so high, <laughs> but um, it, it there is a performance that they do together. Um, I'll send you it. I'll send you a link to it. You can listen to it whenever you want. <laughs> oh, but it's absolutely tonight! Absolutely interesting. <laughs> I can't. I can't wait to hear like a coke field uh, <laughs> performance. Uh, but. Yeah, Nami. <laughs> what are you looking forward to, uh, Star Wars? I know, like, we're not watching Young Jedi Adventures. We're not the target demographic for that. Uh, yeah. But yeah, what, what's what's uh, what, what's the horizon look forward to? Uh, uh, definitely super excited about the Acolyte. I cannot wait. Um, but other than that, I haven't really looked into what's gonna be released anytime soon. So. Uh, cautiously optimistic about new releases and new stuff being made now post strike and hopefully um you know better written stuff uh i i'm a huge mm-hmm. fan of for all mankind and season four just came out i just saw the uh it's on first apple episode. tv right yeah it's so good and and so i'm really excited to watch the rest of that season so when the boys comes out the next season i'll watch that too but i need to watch that uh yeah We'll see. I don't know if like there's gonna be any schedule shifting for a lot of these like yeah. Disney Plus shows because of the strikes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But we'll see. I'm not sure what's the next thing. I think it's supposed to be Skeleton Crew, but but we'll see. We'll see yeah. what happens. Mm-hmm. But anyway, uh, I think that kind of covers it for today. I think this has been like a really fun conversation talking about uh, the Beatles uh, and a little bit of Star Wars. You know, keeping it yeah. keeping it diverse. Uh, but before we wrap up, Charlie, where can people find you? I know you're all over the yeah, place. So you, yeah, sadly. Um, you can <laughs> find me on Twitter or X or 
whatever it's called, Lex Luthor's yeah. platform. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can find me at C-M-W-A-S-H-P-Y. And on there's my link tree where you can find me everywhere else. So handy little place for you to find me everywhere else. Perfect. And we'll put a link there in the description the so that everyone can definitely check Charlie out. Charlie's a great guy and has very good Twitter slash X takes. Uh, one of the best people at Twitter that I've ever met. So make sure make sure to follow Charlie, please. And to oh, listen to the you. Imperial Senate podcast. All three of them are, <laughs> are great people that make amazing content. So please, please make sure to follow them. But yeah, I think with that, uh, I think that covers it for today. For now yeah. and then, I guess. Now and then. Mm. So, Charlie, thank you so much for joining us. It was such a pleasure to meet you since I didn't get the chance to go to a Star Wars celebration. So I hope to one day meet you in person. <laughs> yes, um, and vice versa. Yes, and it was such a good conversation. We love the Beatles. We love Star Wars. There's so many fandoms out there. You just enjoy what you love and, you know, don't criticize the shit out of it. Um, <laughs> so just, you know, like, subscribe, leave us a comment, let us know what you think. And until next time, may the Force be with you. Thank you.